Hey everybody, welcome to We Should Jam Sometime. Um, Craig and I forgot to do a little bit of an intro before uh, the episode here, so I just wanted to touch base real quick. Uh, first off, I know that we've probably got some new listeners here with doing the Ready the Prince interview, with doing the Zig Mentality interview, so welcome. I hope you guys stick around. Uh, Craig and I are trying to get into some more interviews. we got some more stuff lined up in the new year. We're trying to really grow this show going into 2021. I've actually been doing this for about three years and i wanted to just make a quick note here before uh, this episode this is episode 80 and what's crazy about episode 80 is over about two and a half years i did 40 episodes by myself uh sp- stopped for six months started again on and off on and off and when covid happened craig and i got together and started doing this thing again and what's crazy about episode 80 is since april craig and i have now done 40 episodes you know and whatever that in like the nine months or whatever that i did in like two and a half years so this is a special episode for me uh this is the first time i really got to talk to jig uh this is a great episode i don't know how long this episode is i haven't actually edited it down i have to cut some stuff out i gotta make some separate clips we talked for almost two hours i'm gonna try to edit this episode down to about an hour uh but there's gonna be clips coming out so if you are new to this podcast please subscribe wherever you're listening to spotify apple music there's no video this week unfortunately uh jig's video cut out and we did do video on our end but honestly like jig talks a lot in this episode which is good so most of the video is just going to be you staring at us and i just thought you know what screw it that might hurt a little bit on youtube but please you know check it out uh listen to it share with your friends uh the whole point of we should jam some time is not supposed to be an interview craig and i are musicians craig and i are are in bands and we just want to have fun conversations uh with other musicians that we care about conversations with each other uh and just you know shoot the shit about music and have a laugh about you know whatever uh so again if you are new please subscribe please check out uh zig mentality if you haven't already and please check out our bands you know there's lots of music to go around I sing in Lost Arts, Craig plays bass in Heart Attack Kids, uh, but I'm going to shut up now and get you onto the episode. So here's Jig Dubé from Zig Mentality. I didn't grab your sugar-free Red Bull. For some reason, whenever I smoke weed, I want to I wanna cut my fucking hair. I have been to Montreal. All right. <laughs> uh, welcome to We Should Jam Sometime. Uh, I'm Caleb, here with Craig. And uh, for the first time, we've actually, we've met once before. I don't know if he remembers, but we're here with Jig Dubé from Zig Mentality. How you doing, buddy? Not too bad, man. And uh, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that before I, uh, before getting on here, about how we have met before. Because, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely know I've, I've seen you guys somewhere around the, at a New Rock Mafia event at some point. There's just been too many for me to pinpoint which one it was. You and I met, I can't remember the name of the venue, but it was that, uh, it was the one where uh, Cleo ended up, ended up, they couldn't play because I think Luke was sick. And uh, it was at like a video game place or something like that. And we met briefly after the yes. show. Yes. Okay. So that, that uh, yeah, yeah, that was, that would have been like the third night of our New Rock Mafia little mini tour that we did right yeah you guys did uh one show in each uh yeah in each, like hometown yeah exactly exactly oh was that was that like the run where uh like pup showed up at like luke's place or something that was that was yeah that was the night before yeah. holy shit yeah craig did you know about that it rings a bell <laughs> yeah i remember so it was this was a basement show or something like that wasn't it yeah it was it was in luke's basement man what a funny time that was. That was like, cause like the the next day we were like, uh, the Luke and Ian couldn't make it to the to the show in Toronto. So that was that was the one that that we met at there, and uh, yeah, that was because the night before everyone had spent a bunch of time inhaling dust and like fiberglass insulation particles and stuff like from <laughs> a freshly renovated basement. And after that show, like, I was, like, so sick. Like, I was coughing up, like, just the most disgusting stuff that was, like, from all of the dust that we had inhaled um, two nights prior uh, in Luke's basement. And actually, the, the night before that, we did our basement as well. And, then, like, there's probably a bunch more dust inhaling then because you just put all these people in a room and then it's like they're all wearing shoes and whatnot and it's just like and they're all stomping around and you have such a small amount of space that 
the place just gets fogged out and like if the ceiling's unfinished you, the 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 copper plumbing is dripping condensation from yeah. just people <laughs> and it, yeah. it just turns into like this this huge mess of like just terrible air so for the singers who are just on stage just inhaling and just belting their lungs out they end up inhaling them just the most obscure amount of terribleness you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh i haven't played too many basement shows actually but i have a yeah. lot of basement show experience yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of house show experience generally instead of doing the whole what have you been up to in quarantine i was gonna say i feel like you guys have almost the most ideal setup for a you can't leave your house situation in terms of getting shit done as a band because i know but like craig and i both were in situations where like we had at the start of lockdown anyway band members in different cities or like different parts of the country where it was like oh fuck like what are we gonna do yeah. and you guys are all brothers and living under the same house and are on the same roof it's kind of like a perfect situation almost in terms of like songwriting and recording and shit yeah it's been like honestly like before the covid lockdown started we were already kind of just like on lockdown so so like like I, like i don't have anything better to do than to spend my time working on either building our studio or or creating content in our studio with like where the studio is at now and then um and then all the rest of the work that i do would be related to like post-production work or like uh just working on other people's music and so if i'm doing that i'm doing that from here as well so it's kind of just like there's no there's no reason to leave this place other than to go buy groceries or something and uh it's kind of super convenient it really works out because you go like you know you wake up you get out of your bedroom you make your coffee and then you come sit in your control room and you just start you just listen you open spotify and you listen to like some whatever you whatever you want to listen to like whatever's new and and then you start working and you're already in the space that you need to be to do that and everything's all customized to your workflow so it's f fucking convenient um it's also just like it, it, it's also like it it creates a reason for us to have to motivate ourselves to m create because uh, you know there's something very motivating about knowing that you're going into a studio and you're paying and you're only going to be there for x amount of time so you need to have your shit together uh we don't really have that anymore we kind of just sit around and like we it's like we make whatever we want to make so we found that we've been like, diversifying our the amount of things that we've been making like just crazy to like video products and different types of audio products and we're looking into different types of streamable products and whatever we can make f as like high quality content for people to be able to consume since they won't be able to see us live for a while yeah you guys get to live like the fucking dream of like bands writing shit in the studio that everyone dreams of but then they show up in the studio and they're like Oh, today cost us 500 bucks? Fuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Better have the songs written before we show up then. Yeah, man. It was, oh, I mean, it's like, it's like the careers of the Beatles and Pink Floyd that motivated us to, to kind of like, to, to aspire for that because like the way they did is they had, they had negotiated their contract with EMI so that they would have unlimited studio time and it was a pretty normal thing for your EMI to be doing that with their bands at the time. So they landed that in unlimited studio time and kind of just ended up getting in the studio with like the best engineers in the world at the time. And they just made like did drugs and made their music and worked on it and worked <laughs> on it and worked on it. And that's how, you know, like Dark Side came to be. That's how all of these insane albums that you grow up listening to going, holy shit, that's like the, the pinnacle of music there, the, of creativity. And you go, man, well, what did they do? Well, they, they, use their, they use their record label in order to secure unlimited studio time. And so we're like, well, what's the modern equivalent of that? And with, with home recording being a thing, like it's just too easy, you know? It's just too too easy if the passion is there to to just go out and get all the shit that you need to get basically started and then it just turns into a fucking addiction you just can't help but but just do it and improve it and build build on your studio and whatever it is it's it's pretty cool
Right on. I like when people have Beatles knowledge. That makes me happy. <laughs> That's good shit. Yeah, a little bit, little Beatles knowledge here and there. I was, uh, I have almost no Beatles knowledge because when I was in grade twelve, we were, we had to do like a whole unit on them, and it was like it just ruined we, it we were for forced you. to listen to them, and like we had like listening tests and shit. Yeah, and I just I wasn't down for that, <laughs> so so now I just have this like bad taste, and it's not the Beatles' fault; it's my music teacher's fault. Yeah, but definitely. yeah, I mean, someone whatever. oppressed you with with the Beatles discography <laughs> yeah. yeah i remember like at the end of the unit i was like dude you're just forcing the beatles on us and like it's not cool it's like i want to be able to like them and he was like i don't think i'm doing that and i was like i have to memorize 90 fucking songs and then know like any five seconds that you play from them like exactly what song it is that's I think insane it's i think that's like i was like there's like two bands like i could do that for like maybe queens of the stone age and that's it and like yeah, even know. them, like, there's so many songs that start, it's like, fucking the first minute is silence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, yeah. what the fuck, man? Yeah, I'm still heated about it, like, six years later. So. True. Yeah, that's well, that's, fair. that's respect. Like, I, I've always recognized that the Beatles have been, like, a kind of, like, you either, it's just like, you're either a fan or you're not. And it's, like, it's strange because, like, um, a lot of people would think it's, like, you're... Like if you don't like the Beatles, then then there's like something weird about your musical taste. But I've met some of the people who I've met who have said they don't like the Beatles. I've like checked out their musical taste, and they're into like some other whole other type of music that is like because it doesn't align with the the way that the Beatles music went, which was like mainstream pop music at first. And then evolved like it grew out of that. So there's a bunch of underground people who were around w when the Beatles first came out. Who were like, who were like, fuck that shit. And those people have like a completely like different music taste that's super fascinating because it's like super rebellious, you know? Yeah. I so speaking, I've got two points on that. The uh, we had the Spotify Wrapped came out, which by the way, how'd you do? How'd you do for your Spotify Wrapped list? Oh, do I haven't even, I, oh yeah, okay, this is, it's hard, it, my, my Spotify wrapped and it ended up very strange because my girlfriend is on my Spotify account. Oh yeah? <laughs> so she's gone and she's kind of like semi messed up my algorithm listening to like <laughs> Neo and whatever, Selena Gomez, some, every, every, once, every once in a while there's something that's not that's, bad. that's just, un, there's, there's something that's unacceptable on my feed every once in a yeah. while, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I ended up streaming this one album, and and everyone else in this house, I, well, actually, particularly Quinn, he also ended up streaming this album quite a bit. It's this one album by uh, Andre Gagnon, who's like a Quebec, like pianist, and he uh, released an album called uh, Eden, E D E N, and it's just like a piano album. So it's just like nice. soft. It's just like soft piano that turned out to be the thing that I listened to the most. You must have been very zen this yeah. year then. <laughs> That's yeah. fucking great, man. <laughs> but yeah, my Spotify wrapped uh, for the fourth fucking consecutive year. The Beatles were my number one oh, right artist on. of the year. Right on, man. Which is crazy to me because I felt like, yeah, I had like I had a couple like spurts where I listened to them a lot, but it didn't feel like it was all the time. It was apparently I was in like the top point oh five percent of Beatles. That's like out of. 20, 20 like i think it's like 30 million people <laughs> it's insane yeah that is insane um, that's like uh one of my one of my buddies he's in the top 0 0.05 uh percent fan base for uh queens of the stone age nice. really yeah nice i gotta be close i didn't get that this year but i gotta be close yeah i yeah. knew a chick that was 0 .0, 0 0.005 for avril lavigne which i'm pretty sure is like one in like 7,000 people, yeah. <laughs> which is insane. That's impressive. I, I do have my Facebook uh, top fan badge for Queens of the Stone Age. Oh, yeah. yeah. I did get that. That's good shit. For whatever that's worth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so on, on the Beatles, so just to try to connect this, I just heard about 10 minutes ago that, so we're going to go way back here, you opened for the fucking Beach Boys when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. Okay, you got to tell that fucking story. Yeah, I was going to say, it's either like you're either a Beatles fan or a Beach Boys fan. It's, it's one or the other. But uh, Yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, no, we, we had like an opportunity to do one of those CNE band shell gigs. And uh, yeah, no, we, we had a good booking agent at the time out of Toronto um, with Feldman. And so we 
got a sweet slot and it was like it was like really boost because we were pretty young at the time and we were like kind of like a novelty act like kids band novelty act but like we we're just like just starting to take ourselves seriously kind of thing but uh yeah we got this gig and it uh it was opening for the beach boys of the band show which was which consisted of going to the band shell and hanging out backstage and like just like th these guys showing up and it's just like a bunch of old dudes right but they're super they're super like grounded in the live music world obviously because they've been around it their entire lives and so they kind of just like come in and they they have a routine where they they'll hang out with the artists who are on the bill and we just like talk and they told us a bunch of stuff about like how they would write uh, they would get like some of the inspirations for their song ideas and lyric ideas from like greeting cards at pharmacies and shit like that so it was like really cool like conversation like and get the, that kind of insight they told us the classic like don't get lost in drugs and we told them the nice. classic right. well it's already too late guys yeah <laughs> <laughs> No, but it was a super, it was super dope uh, experience. But part of the experience was also like, because this is the band, it's like the CNE, the National Exhibition or whatever it is. Like, you, you, there's also like, there's also like state other smaller stages throughout the the exhibition. And one of the conditions for us getting the slot was that we would play for two days, like as a busking act on the small stages. And so one of the days. After opening for the Beach Boys, we opened for another act, and like this was straight out of Spinal Tap. It was like the, this: the sign that that with the little stage here that, that we we were playing on said like, you know, our band name, and then right over it it said, and like the the main act, My Little Pony reenactment. And You're so, kidding me. <laughs> and so we performed and we opened for My Little Pony and then these grown men in, in pink pony costumes came out and they jumped around <laughs> on the stage and stuff and they did like this oh whole routine. Oh my God, and you so, opened for furries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. That's so that, wild. That's, that's what it takes to open for the Beach Boys. It's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, dude, what was also dude, that cool is a story. Well, man, are you guys you guys big rec fans? Yeah. Oh hell yeah, yeah absolutely. Fuck yeah. So yeah, no, so we, the week after we played, we opened for the Beach Boys. This at the Canadian National Exhibition, they had big rec perform on the same stage, and we just contacted the people who let us into the festival, and we we're like, yo, we want to come see big rec at the band shell, and uh, they they secured a meet and greet for us, but. We didn't make it on time because we stopped at Subway and there was like a Subway employee in training who took like... Oh no, dude. Fuck Subway. 25 <laughs> minutes for one fucking sandwich. Anyways, it was... Oh my God. We And we've literally dude. missed our fucking meet and greet with, with uh, Big Rec over that. Anyways, but we, we showed that up so like semi-late and we got to like stand in the security pit and just watch these guys from front row and it was such a dope show. That was like insane. Just like watching That's them like, switch guitars every song and just just super loud yeah. right in your yeah, face, man. just Ian Thornley ripping right there. You're like, right on, right on. Yeah, yeah. dude, Thornley brings like he brings like fifty guitars with him on yeah. tour. It's yeah, insane. yeah, he's insane. He's insane. We say it all the time. Like Ian Thornley is like grossly underrated. He's insanely like, underrated. It's like, insane. Like I I thought that he was like the Canadian Chris Cornell at first, but then like I thought like that just under under speaks his fucking insane guitar playing like it's yeah, crazy no, that, dude that's so funny you say that because that's literally how, what i refer to ian thornley as he's the canadian chris cornell but better at guitar Absolutely. amazing Absolutely. We're, yeah. we're like the same person dude <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I uh, I just I wanted to just say it's funny that uh, that subway kind of screwed you out of your big wreck uh, situation because we haven't even talked about this in a while. But when Craig and I started this up again at the start of quarantine, we just were doing this whole bit for a while about how subway sucks because like subway. that's where COVID is because you got to like touch everything at subway. Yeah, and we haven't said fuck subway in a while, but this is a perfect opportunity. Yeah, yeah, to bring dude, it fuck, back. Subway. <laughs> fuck subway. Fuck <laughs> subway. Yeah, no, no, it's it's really like it's like shop local, you know. That's really what I learned. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. Local. Go to a local deli, you fuckers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's my fault. My fault. 
It's just close to the highway. It was close to the highway. It's a good stop. Like it felt like it felt like it was gonna be quick, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't usually do this, but I'm gonna go to a subway. All right, don't judge me. Holy fuck! <laughs> I do. Uh, on the topic, I guess that you guys as uh, uh, as kids, I uh, Steve actually enlightened us to this when we were talking to him uh, a couple weeks ago after the podcast because I'd mentioned I wanted to reach out to you guys. And he goes, uh, he goes, do you got, do you know like their origin story? And I was like, oh no, what's up? And he told us, and I, and I Googled it to confirm <laughs> that there was a whole literacy test debacle. I guess it was it a few years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's funny. I, 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 cause I was, I was wondering if you're going to pull up that history or the history that goes further than that or the history that goes further than that. Cause oh I, my God. Dude, there's, well, hi okay, hang how about on. This? I feel balls, like, balls in your yeah, court. We, whatever like, you yeah, whatever you want to yeah, tell okay, us. Well, <laughs> this doesn't have to be tell all, you know, <laughs> I, I, but. <laughs> I, I should probably start at the beginning because like the literacy test thing, like the whole reason the literacy test thing happened is because of our earlier work. So it's a culmination okay. of things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So like, uh, basically long story short, cause I could like, this story would be like a full two hours if I said it the way that I usually <laughs> say stories, long, right. gotcha. long story short, we did, we spent a bunch of time doing uh, fundraising for the, after the Haitian earthquake. And we did that through, okay. through busking. And we were like really fucking young when we were doing that. Like, like Quinn, I think Quinn was 10. So we were playing like, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd covers in the streets outside of music festivals and all these wasted people would come out and they would just dump money into our cases. So we started donating a shit ton of it. We donated like over $250,000 and then um, wow. received like a bunch of local Ottawa community builder awards and shit like that. Like we got no nominated for a Diamond Jubilee Award and... Scott. Okay, so hang on. Let me stop you there for a second. Did you play in front of Rock the Park one year? In front of, in front of what? Rock the Park in London. No. No. Okay. I'm just. I. I was just thinking for a second. I was like, I remember there was a kid band there, and I swear to fucking god, if this was Dubai <laughs> as children, yeah. that's insane to me. No, it's it's likely that that wasn't us. We we did do like, we did one one of our craziest busks was was we went to. Montreal to busk outside the Bell Center right after Roger Waters finished The Wall live on his on his Holy uh, shit, okay. And we played like man, we knew so many Floyd songs at back then that we were able to play for 2 hours all Floyd songs and the crowd Jesus. we just we even played the Floyd songs that we didn't really know, like we only half knew them and the crowd kind of just like <laughs> sang over it and and it was so insane. There were people walking through our busking rig, stepping into the guitar case that we had for to collect this money. People grabbing money out of the case. Like it was just nuts. Like what? People oh put throwing God. money on to Quinn's symbols and like letting like the bills like just flow down like his his ride or whatever onto his kid. Floyd like, fans are animals. What the fuck? Yeah, oh dude. God. Well, it's Montreal Pink Floyd fans. Like the thing about Montreal Pink Floyd fans <laughs> is they're notoriously intense. Notoriously. They're fucking animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh my god. But yeah, so that's that's pretty much our <laughs> earlier work, and then we did through all that like philanthropy work that we did within the fundraising. Um, we got like a lot of really positive press, and like through all these awards and all this stuff. So we became like a like one of those community building uh, like examples to influence kids, and so like the Ottawa right. the the Ontario School Board contacted us and was like, "Yo, we're gonna use this article." um to to put in the literacy test as a like because like that's the kind of shit they put on literacy tests like motivating yeah. stories about your community and young people and so on so it fit the bill and we're like yeah okay sure you guys can do that like we don't care and then a year went by and we're like oh it's the literacy test like uh like we're we should probably expect a bunch of people to just be like holy shit like we just read about you on our literacy test but none of that happened so we're like oh i guess we, they didn't put us on the literacy test. And then we went on like a whole like like rebrand. We started like we changed the name to Dubai and then we started doing a bunch of other stuff. We changed our sound. We started like getting way more into like like the punk rock aspect of things. And like we wanted to really mm -hmm. get a lot more aggressive with our approach to lyric writing and sonics. And so we started like doing stuff about music videos of us like rolling joints with bible papers and stuff and 
while while all that's happening, we don't know this, but the Ontario School Board's like, yo, oh yeah, let's get that story in. Like fucking six years later, they put the story in <laughs> in the literacy test, and so like. It just it just airs on the test, and then all every fucking kid in Ontario who does this literacy <laughs> test, see reads about us, and then they go online. They're like, holy shit! Like this band, like they look us up, and like they find us like rolling joints out of Bible <laughs> Bible pages, and <laughs> they find us like you know talk like playing all this terrible rock music that's like anti-establishment and anti-community <laughs> yeah. building, and like it just looked oh really really bad and. And there are a few parents complained, and and so like the the school board had to make an apology, saying we didn't know what the band was up to, and so we kind of just prematurely put that in, and and it kind of just trended for a while that like oh my god, these guys put a pot smoking Ottawa band on the literacy test, and then <laughs> and then man even CBC put out a, a fantastic article in my opinion that was like. Yeah, so it, it was like a headlined pot. Yeah, it's like oh, pot smoking Ottawa band goes viral after featuring being featured on the literacy test, which is yeah. just which is accompanied with a photo of me rolling, <laughs> rolling a Bible joint. It's too good. <laughs> that's fucking incredible, dude. It's, you can't pay for that yeah, kind of no, press. It's kind of great. It's kind of great. But that yeah, that, I guess that's the that's the story that that's that's our history according to Steve. If you will, yeah, 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 that's fucking great. Well, big shout out to Steve on our last episode. You can go check that out, I suppose. But holy shit, yeah, yeah. He he definitely he propped you up for for a good reputation on We Should Jam sometime oh, yeah. before we gave you the call. Yeah, mm. I was like, I had no idea. I read that CBC article too. It was a good article. I was, was like, so this good. is fucking amazing. <laughs> like, yeah, like there's literally no like so. So obviously there's like some controversy, but then like what's after that like is that when you guys started to see like some success after that or what was sort of the nah, outcome man. of I mean, all I mean, that like honestly something like that will hurt your numbers more than it will grow them <clears throat> although you'll see some mm. growth you'll see some like growth some activity but when the people are are memeing about it they're they're not going to stick mm -hmm. around for very long right and so we yeah, uh, so right. we kind of like expected that obviously you kind of just like you and and at the same time a shit ton of people got to discover got to get turned on to our music as a result and they're like oh shit like i actually like and i like this band and more more than that like i noticed like a lot of teachers s noticed that it started uh reaching out to us and saying yo I, I i came to know you guys through the literacy test and i love your music and so we're like <laughs> that's great we, we did a we did a couple of like like mini like tours like like stop bys at school to promote a gig in toronto one time at the velvet underground and uh that's like exactly what i've always wanted to do <laughs> that's yeah, so sick the, the, but the, the method was just like show just basically send a tweet out saying we're pulling up to this high school for lunch on your lunch break and we just pulled up and then parked our van and then all these kids just came out because it's their lunch break and they all just came and they're like because like they all know us from the ossl that they just did and so they're like oh shit it's the kids from the OSLT and so like we also had a bunch of teachers who would come out during that time and we, we just talked to a bunch of people and, and they're like just blown away but how old like how old we were compared to when the article was written and shit and just really it's just really funny just like a surreal experience and then just to, to be like oh yeah I know come see our show at the Velvet Underground it's all ages and so you'll be able to get in it's pretty dope it's a good way to cap that off you know yeah, for sure. So was that just like a couple summers ago that you guys were doing that? Yeah, I'm not very good with timelines, but I'm going to say yeah. that, that was well, two I, years ago. Okay, because I'm, I'm just trying to like, I I feel like I remember seeing that on Instagram. Yeah, because yeah, totally I, uh, yeah, because I heard, I like first heard Stone Love off of just like a Spotify playlist. I think you guys might have actually been like the cover of the playlist. And this was before, I don't even think I had started listening to Cleopatra at the time. Mm. So I'd heard Stone Love and I was like, oh, this is a cool song. And I like followed you guys. And I think, I feel like I remember seeing these videos on Instagram of you guys going to schools and stuff like that. So it must've been like, I'm trying to, I, I'm losing track of time. I feel like that was like two summers ago. Though. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Let's put our heads together and, and claim that that is reality. Okay, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> nice, that's the, perfect. That, it now it doesn't matter if it happened that way or yeah, not. Yeah, exactly. That's, it was two exactly. years ago. 
That's incredible. Yeah, man. That is an incredible. That's like a when, good lore. To yeah. Have. When the Zig Mentality documentary comes out in like twenty years, <laughs> is it, it going to be a great first ten minutes? I think of yeah. the yeah. Of well, the dude, doc. man, we we've we've fantasized about how fucking great our documentary is going to be. Not even like <laughs> musically speaking or like in terms of like because the band could go absolutely fucking nowhere and our documentary would right. be fantastic. It would probably be even better yeah. Yeah. if the band didn't go anywhere. That would be an even better fucking documentary. So we're all yeah, excited about like it. hardcore logo or something. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah like <laughs> like we got like Quinn. Quinn is really good at documenting stuff. So he, he does. He's very concerned with making sure that like, you know, our, all our our business calls are documented and like the whole every moment that happens that's like a pivotal moment in in this band is going to be is is the idea is that we capture it so for our documentary that's never going to get made but it's going to be great it's going to we call it uh, it's we call it it's so good you'll never see it yeah dude like prince like yeah. you're fucking you're making it all it's just going to go right in the fucking vault <laughs> Um, I did want to, we, 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 uh, blew by it, but that's okay. When we were talking about, uh, how kind of you, your natural habitat is already at home and everything with the quarantine, but you guys were already trying to sort of perfect the live stream before yeah. quarantine. Yeah. And then there was that, you know, kind of like month of panic for like all artists of like, Oh fuck, what do we do? And everybody was live streaming and you guys kind of already had the upper hand of like, cause like the big issue with live streams is that the quality is absolute trash. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you Absolutely. guys are already working on like, well, we're, if we're going to do this, it's going to sound fucking great. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know if I really have a question about that, but it, yeah, well, I mean, like, speak freely. The thing, the thing about our live streams is like, like to me, it's, from a technical standpoint, the whole mission of bringing quality live streams to our fans is so we're so far from actually being able to produce a quality live stream for our fans by our standard. Now, we understand, like, obviously it's fantastic to have the setup that we do because what we have right now is all of our channels individually m mixed. Like, we send it into Pro Tools and we apply our plugins and our processing. We adjust the phasing and everything to make it sound as, as good as we possibly can. And then we send it out to a phone interface that receives the audio while we're streaming. But uh, the issue is... Instagram only takes audio and mono, uh, and that com that completely destroys the mix that we make. So, we we've yet to successfully stream in stereo, but I think over the course of the the pandemic, we've actually been able to develop a method that's going to work in stereo. So that's going to be the, the the cool thing about our next live stream is we're going to be able to promote it as a stereo live stream, even though we tried to promote our last one as a stereo live stream. But it turns out YouTube also doesn't support stereo off of a phone. So we've had to find solutions elsewhere. Um, yeah, but yeah, man, our, the live stream is, is a continuous grind. We want to make it you all guys are the way generating some fucking million dollar ideas here <laughs> yeah. you know that right like you should be contacting these companies <laughs> and like developing that shit for them you could make a bajillion dollars yeah well i mean there, there are already a bunch of companies that are that are doing like live stream production stuff it's just um like man like the thing the thing that i don't see is and obviously like because it's it's very rare like to have a to have a band with an en with an engineer who's able to put it all together but that's that's my ultimate favorite thing is is listening to a mix made by the artist because that's that's going to produce the most weird the the most weird uh different sounding l live streams that you're that you're ever going to that you're ever going to get to see that's how limits are going to get pushed instead of going to a production company that's going to supply you with a generic amount like it's just like oh t i'll take your signal and then just send it to the mix and then pan it to the right spot and then just turn it up is completely different than what we're doing which is we need to we actually do virtual sound checks where we s will spend the time playing a song and then we'll come in and take the stems that we just recorded and then we'll mix them we'll spend a bunch of time like cutting out the offensive frequencies mixing everything so it sounds really good and then when we activate those channels and we go back in our live room and just play back through that session and we just send the output to our to our live stream it sounds like how it would sound if we spent if we spent a day working on post-production on on uh, some recordings that we did 
So it's like it's already halfway to like a real product the moment it's being streamed, and that's like a huge deal for us because because uh, as soon as as soon as you can as soon as you can bring stereo, you're gonna have a full. We're gonna have a full static mix to offer that's at the quality that uh, that our mixes would sound right before we we would master them, for example. So it's pretty dope. Oh my god, that's insane! I'm learning shit right now. I hope you know that. <laughs> oh my god, live stream is something everyone should know how to do in today's day and age because uh, it's we're we're at that point now. It's like it's 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 f at least for now you are not going to be able to play any shows without without uh live streaming otherwise you're just going to wait and not really down to wait uh, in fact i like the idea of playing shows from my basement and i like the idea of being able to make them sound better than any house guy could make us sound in any venue this is like uh it's just, it becomes a comfortable scenario obviously it, you got to you, you miss the whole people aspect of things but that's the fucking reality that we all got to live with for <laughs> well, now. Well, the thing that's scary to me is that I'm worried that the people aren't going to miss it. You know, like they're not going to miss having to go to the venue and find parking and fucking having right. it like be there. Like I'm I'm worried that people are going to get too comfortable at home and they'll be like, hey, shows are good again. And they're just like, are they going to stream it? Like, <laughs> you know, like they're not going to want to show up. They're going to be like, oh, I'll just watch the fucking stream. Totally agree. I totally agree. I think yeah. I think you're gonna see a, a huge decrease in people wanting to show up, which in turn will result like to me. That's those are all the people that show up to your show and just kind of just stand around. So, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting because the smaller amounts of people who do show up are going to be showing up for the right reasons, and all of a sudden we're gonna see these incredibly energetic, cu curated crowds of people who are more than passionate for for what they're there for and that's like a utopian reality that i'm kind of like inventing for myself in the hopes that that's no that's good happen, i think that i think that holds that i think that holds weight where you know the people that do show up to the shows are going to be very invested in the show no doubt yeah it's going to be like like man it's going to be like guys after their no nut november trend you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just gonna they're gonna watch that show so hard four times a day. You can expect that. And they're gonna want they're gonna wanna change it up every time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no doubt, dude. They're gonna expand their horizons, all right? <laughs> it is gonna be that's gonna be an interesting change though, you're right, because like I'm sure shows will be a lot of shows will also just be live streamed probably moving forward, as well as being able to be there in person. Which yeah. is gonna be tough for like the local bands of like, will you come to my show, please? And they're like, uh, uh, please. I'm we... just gonna spend five less dollars and like buy the stream or like well, <laughs> yeah, however, yeah. however it's gonna work. Just wait till people get their their hands on on uh, 360 streaming and uh, virtual yeah, yes. virtual reality streams because that's when that's when it's like pretty much game over with like like ambisonic audio. You can pretty much recreate any environment on a set of headphones and it's good enough for the average joe so it's uh, that you're going to see that shift for sure you guys are developing that right like zig mentality <laughs> virtual reality come on uh, fucking well, do, sells itself have you guys seen our uh, have you guys seen our session on music video yes which i was actually watching it again last night and i was like how the fuck are they doing this but it's probably just a 360 cam Exactly, and what do you need to live stream in 360? You need a 360 cam. You need a 360 cam. <laughs> so we are working on it. We're gonna figure it out. It's just a question Holy of time. Holy shit, dude! You guys are gonna make so much money. <laughs> <laughs> get it? Well, I mean, the, the first we get, we need everyone to get goggles, right? We gotta get through that whole that whole thing, and then yeah. there's and then what I'm trying to like what I'm really working on. What I spend like most of my days thinking about is is how to get ambisonic, which is like 360 audio, to to a streamable format because it's impossible to fucking stream right now. So once it becomes streamable, you can you can create an ambisonic mix so that when somebody tunes into your live stream, as they turn their head the audio turns as well and they can like they can face the drummer and hear the drums and mono and in, in in like in their center in the center image and then they'll turn the bassist and then it'll shift and the drums will pan over and then the bass will come into center shit like that it's uh 
it's we're pretty far away from it, but man, like it there's you could probably make content at least that's not streamable like that. But the best would be if, if you could stream that because you could have literally somebody just tune into your basement show and be in your basement watching you play and they get to listen to whatever they want to listen to by just kind of like looking in that direction and leaning towards it. And that's like, that's if, if there's a way to play shows for people in a time like this, it looks something like that to me. You know, it looks something like, especially with the high quality audio because then it's like you know it's like it's not like it's not like we're making you we're making you uh settle for some bullshit here we're not making you settle for some shitty little recording that we put together we're this is the best fucking experience that we could possibly produce for you and it's even better in many aspects than in the experience of going to the show where you know you're not centered in between the two speakers so you don't get an even image and you know you can't pan things at a live show because then it, people standing in different areas of the crowd aren't going to hear things properly so it's 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 really like it makes you appreciate a whole different aspect of the show which is obviously the visual like the very intense visual of being on the set and the audio that's just like microscopically accurate in your ears that that just allows you to really study the live show rather than kind of just get lost in it which is not a bad thing but it's just a different way of enjoying a show you know you're really selling me here man <laughs> I, like i don't know if i'm gonna go to a show anymore i'm just gonna wait <laughs> you'll get to the point Everything, everything will balance itself out, you know. Like after, after a bunch of like non going to shows and consuming VR content, I'm sure you'll, we'll all get to the point where we're gonna be like, man, I wonder what it would be like to experience reality, and then we'll all go yeah. out and experience <laughs> yeah. reality, and that'll be the coolest fucking <laughs> yeah. thing ever. Everyone's gonna be, like, oh, it's gonna be so underground and niche to experience reality. We're gonna be part yeah. of the reality club, but. Yeah, it'll be like Demolition Man, where yeah. people are just like, wait, you guys still fuck manually? Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, be like, oh, it was actually super sick. That guy, like, actually sweated on me. It was cool <laughs> yeah, to have his stink on me for the rest of the night. And every restaurant's <laughs> going to be Taco Bell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. Actually, I'm like, I was just thinking here, because I actually went to school for, we did I did two years of music industry arts, and then I did a year of... Uh, audio post and we like fucked around a little bit with like 3d sound and stuff and like placing sound in like specific areas of the video i'm just sitting the whole time you explained that i was like how did i not ever put that in like a live show mm -hmm. like situation well yeah no i i'm convinced music is gonna is gonna eventually be made available in that format and it's gonna be like absolutely it's gonna be like shifting from mono to stereo and then like the new thing is going to be 360 so people are just going to adapt and music's going to start to get made in 360 and then people are going to start to get used to hearing things in 360 because audio for video games is already ambisonic so it's already 360 so people are already getting used to that in the gaming community so it's true that v people will come out with video games now that don't have ambisonics like you'll notice like the latest call of duty uh what's this like War warcraft or whatever I my brother plays it, but I don't know what it's called. But the latest Call of Duty has has you put on the headphones, and you can hear somebody like walking behind you over your yeah. head, like so you can hear Dude, that. Dude, that's shit. so funny. I I didn't think about that, and like even so, I play fucking Castle Crashers. Did you <laughs> do you know that game? <laughs> Yeah, like is that like a mobile? It's game? like it's like a so it's like Newgrounds made this shit, right? So I bought it just so my friends and I can still like we just go on Discord, we talk, we shoot the shit, and we play this stupid video game. So yeah. I I don't play fucking video games. So I started buying this. I I got a headset and shit, and I'm playing it in my living room, and I'm hearing fucking gunshots <laughs> like behind my. This is not a gun game, <laughs> right? And I'm like, look, I'm like stopping the game. I'm like, dude, there's like someone shooting outside my window or some shit. <laughs> And like it was just that one level, and it was like there was sound behind my head, and it was I was losing my fucking mind. <laughs> yeah, man. I was like, "There's no chance this fucking 2D Newgrounds video game has this shit." And clearly, they've updated it. That's dude. Video games have 3D sound now. Three, yeah, no, it's, 360 it's very, sound. It's, it's very trippy, crazy. and uh, and I think uh, the more people get used to that quality of of depth and stereo imaging, like the people are going to start to expect that in music, and you're going to start to see pop producers start to start to make it available, and it's it's just a matter of time before streaming pl uh, platform makes 
B format, which is the audio protocol for for three for Amazonics three sixty audio, is going to make that available for just regular consumers to listen to or to stream. So then that creates a huge demand for artists who are making music to make versions of their songs in 360 as well, ambisonics, so that people who have ambisonic systems can listen to them. Uh, but it's going to be, at this point, it would be early adopters who would be doing that. And right now, it's like this, now is the time to do the research on it, to get familiar with the concept. But uh, I think as soon as people have the technology to listen to ambisonic stuff, there's going to be this huge, ex huge expectation. Like, okay, where's my ambisonic music now? And all these musicians <laughs> yeah. are going to be like, what? Like, Amazonic music. Fuck! I just thought there was two speakers involved in this whole deal, but yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt. It, it's happened before, uh, so I think it'll happen again. Absolutely. We uh, actually, when I was in school, we uh, we had a guy. We were, we were doing like uh, like surround sound uh, mixing, and we had a guy come in who had like remixed a bunch of Rush stuff in mm. surround sound. Yeah, and, like that was fucking cool. Like they had like we all like individually like sat in the sweet spot of the studio. And I can't remember what we listened to, but like whatever. Here, like fucking Tom Sawyer and like surround sound, and Crazy. that was fucking trippy. No way. So <laughs> and like three 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 uh, D is like the next step up from that, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm excited having here heard, heard Rush and surround sound. I'm 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 very excited. Well, I'm gonna help somehow lead this movement. Yeah, we're buy gonna some get stocks, <laughs> yeah, man. Can, get... When can we buy stocks? Yeah, in we want to buy it. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll uh, something we gotta talk about, but I'm not gonna just ask the basic question because I already know. We already know, but we do have to talk a little bit about New Rock Mafia. So I'm not gonna ask you what is it because I think you guys are gonna be fielding that question for the rest of your lives, Constantly. for the rest of your careers. We already know what it is. My question is more so, um, since you guys kind of already had like I think a little bit of success before, I think the three of you met up. Now, obviously, correct me if I'm wrong in any of this, but I'm I'm more interested in like how how has like growing the new rock mafia changed how you guys have like if at all a, like approached the band and like has it affected or like has it shaped how you guys have decided to move forward how you guys want to promote stuff has it amped anything up um, mm. you know any, anything yeah, like well, that I I'm that's a tough question because like I mean, it's not something I've really thought about a lot because uh, it kind of just feels all like one thing that's happening. So I'm not necessarily measure measuring the effects that New Rock Mafia is having on on our band separately. But dude, like the way that I see it is, New Rock Mafia is a really perfect way to kind of just place an umbrella over over what it is that these three bands were kind of describing as the thing that they didn't like about where rock was at today. And you can't just like explain this because like, you, like you find, you'll find yourself just like saying like things like, Oh yeah, no, I don't like how like rock drum sounds are today. And then it's like, somebody will be like, yeah, but what about this one song? And it turns out that that one drum sound is actually super fucking dope. But so then you, so then, you, so then people just go, okay, well then it's not the drum sounds that's the problem with rock. It's got to be something else. And then they look at composition and they'll look at X, Y, Z. And it's like, we kind of just like, we all have like a general feeling of like what it is. Like, it's just like a f general feeling of, of like inauthenticity. And that's, and, and the honesty is where like we, the emphasis was placed on, on what we felt rock needed. And so that's why it was so easy for us to all come together and be like, yeah, okay, this makes sense. We all share the same values, the same ideas. Let's put in, let's give that a name so that we can find all the other people who, who see it the same. And that's worked so well, man. That's kind of just launched us into a, a community of people, which honestly, thinking back on it now, like with us being signed to a, a label, uh, we probably would have gotten launched into a direction that would have just kind of dumped us into like either like a like a oh, modern punk category or like a classic rock area like because like you know the label's not the label's not particularly looking at establishing a new genre they're kind of just looking at finding an act that's going to do really well in a genre that already exists so the fact that we had New Rock Mafia, like, as a thing, as we got on our label, kind of just 
made it just kind of forced us all to work with the label in a way that wasn't going to get in the way of the New Rock Mafia stuff, which kind of put the label in check because that just made them. It made made a bunch of their ideas like uh, like kind of just like not not make sense from a branding perspective because it doesn't align with what we're doing with New Rock Mafia. So we were able to to really to to really stay on to the the natural integral path that we would have wanted to to stay on uh despite being with a label because it's really hard to do that because you got to make compromises with everybody that you're working with but it's a uh, that I feel like I'm, in many ways that's one of the big reasons that I have to be grateful for being part of New Rock Mafia uh, because man like that's that's this new whole new chapter that we've just opened up on um ever since leaving the label has just got us very excited about being in this band and about being part of this movement and about being like able to produce this sound that we're we were all excited about that and we're all ready to like really just just start pumping music into and and to really show all uh, all of these rock folks what uh what we think rock is which is like a new way of thinking as far as we're concerned fuck yeah that's fucking sick god damn i got like entranced by that that's beautiful man that's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> yeah man well i i totally feel you there where like like labels aren't really wanting to take a fucking leap of faith on people they want to like they want to adopt bands that like yeah you'll fucking market well to our classic rock yeah. category or to our pop guys or to our punk guys and shit but absolutely yeah you guys kind of had you had your own thing going and they didn't want to fuck with that which is awesome yeah we kind of realized that as, as we got on to we were kind of just like okay and now that we're on now we can share all our great ideas with the team and then as we started sharing our ideas with the team the team kind of just started looking at us and going that's a great idea let's do it and then we kind of just started realizing like wait a second why do we need this team why do we need to you know, give up ownership of our masters for access to this team when they're just going to look at us and be like, great idea, <laughs> do it. And then, so like, fact, we could, man, we could be doing this, all, all of this at home, no problem. And, and it kind of just worked out because of COVID, actually. It worked out to be like that, which was fantastic. So we just kind of just took our beautiful, really nicely framed L and we put it up on our wall of fame here in, in the control room and we kind of just sat back and went all right now we can release something no one's gonna stop us from releasing anything and that just felt like Fuck the yeah. most new rock mafia thing about us at that moment so mm -hmm. that's like yeah yeah i really do have i really do have the movement to thank for that Fuck yeah. yeah that's beautiful that's like it's one of those things where it's like uh it's like yeah you like you said friend of perfectly we're like we took we took the l and we hung it up and and it's actually like it's kind of a w like yeah. the l is a w yeah man and i think you if you take two l's and you kind of angle them right like accurately <laughs> yeah exactly you can kind of you can make a w out of that no problem you just need yeah, two, two l's. l's make a w oh dude, my god dude, two l's make a w man my fucking life is changed right now <laughs> dude, there you go I think we Holy got an episode shit. name. Two L's make a Two W. Two L's make a W, baby. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah, that's beautiful. And like I, um, I'm like I've kind of seen it. Like I mentioned this with uh, when Steve was on, uh, because I I met Ready the Prince like right before like New Rock Mafia was like a thing that was like I said last time before there was like a fucking Instagram account. I had noticed this like hashtag starting or whatever, and it's been like wild to watch it grow as it has. And I think I've like I've been there for pretty much like this whole ride thus far, and been to some secret shows, and I get the fun emails and shit. And uh, <laughs> it's a cool thing to be a part of because it is. I've mentioned it with the and with Steve, but like it's like this cool underground thing that's yeah. worldwide, mm. which is really fucking cool. Like it it has the same like special feeling of if you're in like your your hometown's underground scene, but it's like you get to connect with people all over the world yeah yeah and that's no, amazing I, honestly in that sense it's genius and like i say it's genius because it's not really mine it's not really my doing to be to be brutally honest like a lot of that is is luke's brain he's pretty he's pretty good at that stuff and and like i i think about it a lot and one of the observations that i had to myself about the way that you know kind of the whole thing was created is is very much like you say an underground community that but 
it's like a modern underground community because the thing about underground communities is they're always they were they've always been geographically based you know it's like a, oh like you know like like there's a movement that comes out of Seattle right and there's a movement that comes out of like New York or there's a move like whatever it is and so with with this with this whole idea about New Rock Mafia is you're kind of just taking that underground culture and you're apply you're like bringing the internet into the whole equation and you're saying okay like what what does an underground culture look like online and it's super dope because the way to to kind of like create an underground culture online would like you got to do things that feel underground online and so like man like how like how, like I couldn't come up with an idea as to how how you would do that but Luke comes up with these ideas like where did, maybe he fucking maybe he steals them from someone else like it might be giving him too much credit but he he'll come up with an idea and and it will be exactly like that you know like it's got to be like okay these people sign up to a, a newsletter and then we we send out like a, this secret link and then they click on the link and then like a treasure map shows up and then they got it's like it turns out it's an it's an online treasure map and you got to type in like some coding you got to learn like some basic like IP address pinging and then you got to get your <laughs> ping done and then you got to get your ping back and it turns out the ping has like a little code and then the code like you type it into like this 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 audio decoder and it turns into like this this <laughs> message and it's like a really low distorted voice going Wednesday 4 p.m. <laughs> and it's totally <laughs> And then you're like, oh, you tune in on Wednesday, and then it turns out, oh shit, there's like access to like this website. Like, like I couldn't come up with any of that, and that's like a really creative way to use the internet to kind of like to take to to really to uh, centralize an underground community of people that spread all around the world and kind of bring them all in one place, and it not feel like, oh, I just follow this page, you know, and they kind of just post dope <laughs> stuff. Right. That sounds like something that I would love to do and would make my mother cry with frustration to try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I gotta type what in? Yeah. Where do I go? <laughs> totally, dude. She, she couldn't even figure out fucking iTunes and I'm like trying to fucking... <laughs> I'm just trying to get the new fucking Cleopatra yeah. song. Yeah. <laughs> I learned how to code to get this fucking these new tunes. It's sick. <laughs> it's fucking cool. It's really cool. You, you should, should jam. jam. So Craig said, so yeah, we do like a you should jam thing. Uh, basically what what it is with just Craig and I, we just give each other an album each week from our past or whatever to listen to. Um, so you can take this however you want. If you have like an album that you really want us to hear or just some like artists that the people should check out, we should check out. Uh, any recommendations really, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I got, I think I got three or four good recommendations for albums that have that have really been spinning um one of them is uh tame impala currents that's nice that's yep that's been the pinnacle of um of production for me lately uh the other one has been uh unknown mortal orchestra's multi-love Yep, big yep for me also. <laughs> that's a yeah, that's a really fantastic concept album about polygamy that um, I thought was very interesting from all sorts of different angles. And then um, these other two albums, obviously, big one for us has been Dog Whistle, Show Me the Body, uh, which is a hardcore, it's like a hardcore slash hip hop record. Um, the guitarist plays a banjo instead of a guitar, so he's not a guitarist, but he's a banjo player. And, Damn. Okay. <laughs> and that album, guys, Dog Whistle, absolutely fucking rips. Uh, it's been it's been like uh, an inspiration for for a lot of the productions that we've been working on lately. And then uh, the last one, which is probably my top recommendation for uh, for must listen right now, would be. Uh, this techno record by Stefan Botson called Powers of Ten. That that is a it is a record that took this guy eight years to make, um, and he made it with uh, this one really fantastic synthesizer from the Moog series. That uh, you could just hear this guy absolutely owning his synthesizer throughout this album and absolutely just making it shine in every aspect 
it blew my fucking mind and it made me completely reconsider um, the integrity of electronic and techno music in general. Uh, so yeah, Powers of Ten by Stefan Botten. That's that's at the top of my list. Get a good system with a that's good a sub different and countdown that. right there. Yeah, man. Hey, you gotta listen yeah, to a lot. A they're, they're all DIY artists. That's the thing. They're all big into nice, recording yeah. themselves, and and that's what I really hear because I, I don't hear a producer or a, a mixing engineer tainting the project uh, as much as I do in in other genres and in other well, just in in other artists and in other albums. I hear that all the time. So it's pretty cool to me to to hear albums like that that come out that that feel like that. And if and the last thing that I would say that everyone should listen to is the new unreleased Cleopatra. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> you guys, all you new rock mafia motherfuckers, just keep plugging each other it's and I good. love it. It's, it's awesome. Absolutely, man. Those guys <laughs> like awesome. those guys have some some of the honestly, my opinion, some of the best sounding stuff that uh that our genre will have the pleasure of seeing. Um yeah man and it's all and it's all thanks to their wicked team and they have they have a lot of really great ideas. And they're doing so well right now. So, the answer that that's that's an extra little piece of information. Soon, listen to Cle the new Cleopatra. As as I've been told to say, soon. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, yeah. I'm a uh, I'm stoked for Luke is a great like lyricist too. Like I'm uh, yeah, I'm big dude. on lyrics and I fucking every so often one will hit me and I'm like God this motherfucker dude. Yeah, he's, he is definitely like that. He's got some pretty fantastic. Like we've we because Quinn and I spent a bunch of time um, with those guys in the studio while they were tracking the record, and you know we like I I heard every single one of Luke's vocal takes, and I have like so many of his lyrics stuck in my head. Just every once in a while, just walking around, and I'll just think this one this one Luke line. And I'll just have it stuck in my head, and then I'll be walking around, and Quinn will have the same line stuck in his head, and we'll be like, "No way!" Yeah. And it's like, "Oh no, yeah. you had the same unreleased Cleopatra stuck in your head? That's dope." Bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually saying to Steve uh, when we were off air last time. Uh, whenever, like, I'm I, one day we're gonna get them on here, uh, but I wanna I wanna talk to him about the depths because there's a lot about that song lyrically that i'm like i think we had the same high school experience mm. <laughs> and and like the pre-chorus to that song when i first heard it i was like fuck this is the pre-chorus i've been like i've been trying to write this pre-chorus for like <laughs> years and then and this is exactly how it should be but yeah yeah i think that's that's pretty funny luke's just got a way with words man i have a uh i have a silly question to end this off mm. i was thinking about um i was thinking about this uh, today I was like what what because I asked Steve to give me the stamp of approval on being Italian I don't know if you saw that it didn't go my way and I was thinking what's something <laughs> silly I could ask Jig and I, I it hit me so I started this TikTok account for the podcast just to like passively put up videos I was like I don't know fucking there's TikTok yeah. maybe this will help grow the show so anyway I was just like po putting up the clips I was putting on Instagram and not thinking anything of it and I put up this like 15 second clip and i left for a couple days and i came back and it blew up like it went like kind of viral and it's just a clip of craig and i basically reminiscing about high school and how all of these like teenagers you know all of our friends or whatever used to smoke popper tokes yeah <laughs> and it went like viral because ever like craig was like making the noise that you make when you yeah. smoke popper my, tokes. my take on popper tokes went viral on tiktok <laughs> Oh, that's... So we're the we're the we're the popper toke podcast now. Yeah, and I was just basically <laughs> I mean, or just wondering, I guess if there's a question, if you you know, you have an opinion on popper tokes, if you're mm. a fan of popper tokes, <laughs> if you have a good story about popper tokes. Also, so the kids are calling them chop now. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> no, yeah, They're yeah, chop no, apparently. This, yeah, no, popper tokes. This is something that I'm uh, quite unfamiliar with because I'm one of those uh like uh, anti-tobacco guys. Nice. I'm one of those judge you and wish you were dead for smoking tobacco guys. <laughs> oh, damn. All right. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm totally... No, I, <laughs> I honestly, I just never got around to it. Uh, like, I, I was always, like, I was... It was just naturally easier for me to find myself, like, in having access to weed than cigarettes. So, I just never got good at smoking cigarettes. In fact, I never really tried. But there have been a few 
like I do have one story in relation to this because I was said to anybody when you say popper toks, are you referring to like like a like it's like a bong with with weed and tobacco? Yeah, Pretty, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, there yeah. Are, there are a few varieties, I suppose, but I mean spliffs don't count. Spliffs are fine, people. You can do that. Yeah. Okay. So so it, this is gonna make me sound like a a total bitch, but um, cause, cause you just said spliffs are fine, but this one time that I did smoke tobacco was in a spliff and the story goes like we were at a party in Europe and we were hanging out with these guys and, and, uh, like they knew that we were Canadian and we only smoke pure joints. Like we're only, we're, we don't put any tobacco in our joints. And like to them, like this is like a foreign concept because in Europe, you yeah, don't, you don't just European smoke thing. weed like that. Yeah. You don't just smoke all your kush. That's just like, he, he says that, uh, he, this guy says he's going to make us a purely roll joint. It's going to be so amazing. Okay. And we're like, let's do this. Let's, let's smoke this pure joint. And, and, uh, we're like, there's no tobacco in here. Right. And he's like, um, no, <laughs> there's no tobacco in there. I didn't put any tobacco. I know you, I know you guys smoke pure roll. No. And we're like pretty wasted. So we're like, let's do this. So we, we light up and I take a toke of this, this thing and I honestly dude oh my god I've never felt this this uh, disoriented in my life <laughs> after smoking anything so I was like yeah that tobacco gets me higher than the pot which is uh, yeah which is oh, strange yeah. but a lot of people look at me and go that's weird like you know I, I just sit in my car and smoke cigarettes I'm like I would not be sitting in my car if I was smoking a cigarette I would be laying down <laughs> on my dash with my face <laughs> <laughs> that's just pure pure and simple so that's my one experience with poppers yeah yeah I have a similar well, the first time I ever experienced that I have a similar story where like I didn't know that there was tobacco in this thing and I was standing up and then I smoked it and I, I was like, where can I sit? <laughs> Holy shit. Like I hit the deck, man. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, but yeah, it's, it's the sounds that people make after they smoke it that we got viral on TikTok for. That is hilarious. And I'm sure you're, you're not unfamiliar to those <laughs> nah. horrific sounds. No, no, no. We have, we have a good joke that in our, in our house that goes like when somebody, when somebody rips the bong and then they find themselves going like, <laughs> there's always yeah. there's some there's always someone in the room who goes down out down out yeah. <laughs> writing a song along to it do fucking sweet leaf after sweet leaf such, yeah. a, <laughs> such a beautiful moment oh man that's amazing well <laughs> well okay well before we leave guys I got a question for you guys I want to know um what is in your guys' opinion what is Describe to me the ideal Lost Arts drum sound. Oh fuck! Lost Arts drum sound. Oh, dude. Yeah. What do you guys? Dude, I... What do you guys like? If you could wave a magic wand, what would your drums sound like? Would they sound like how you guys have them sounding on your records now? You know what, man? This is funny because this is a thing that we always we don't argue about it, but we're like never on the same page about. I know because like I'm a. This is true with every band. I've noticed this with a lot of bands. That it, it, it's is very varying opinions on the drum sounds, which is why I'm so interested in it. This is why I, I like asking people if they can describe to me what an amazing drum kit sounds like to them. I have like I'm I'm really like the I guess the best way with like just an example is like I'm a huge Queens of the Stone Age fan mm. and. I love like the Queens of the Stone Age. Like, like I like like a tighter drum sound. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, and like Nick always wants them fucking like huge and like verby. Yeah, shit. and like yeah. reverb. And I'm I not a verby like a, guy. Either. I like a tight. I like a Dave Grohl style. Yeah. drum. You know, any anything that Dave Grohl has played drums on, I'm happier than a pig and shit with those sounds. Nice. Um, also with the band, I have I have to do that plug again. Just like anything, Leave on Helm did drums on sounds fucking great to me. So I feel like the best way to put that is uh, uh, a snappy snare and boomy everything else. Mm. Yeah, and, and nice. you know the symbols. The symbols are kind of fucking to user's discretion, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. yeah, boomy everything and fucking snappy snare. That's all I give a shit about. Keep it simple. That's yeah, I'm the, I'm the same. Very interesting. That's so insightful, guys. <laughs> I was like, is that a good answer? I gotta, yeah. I, I, you know, personally, I have confidence in my answer. Dude, that's the but, most honest and meaningful answer you guys could have possibly given to that. 
<laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. Dude, dude. Jake, you're all right, man. You know what, man? <laughs> yeah, I feel... I feel better about myself. I yeah, gotta say, really. I, we've, I've done 80 of these now, and this is the best I've felt after one. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, for real, man. It was it was great chatting with you. We gotta I've, do another one of these I've for learned. sure. Absolutely, yeah. man. We can also, we can hit stop on the recording, and we can chat for a bit longer if you want to, but... Yeah, um, yeah, no problem. We can, is there anything else you want to say on the episode? Um, Man, not really. Leave us with... I don't got... I don't you got, got the last word. Say I, whatever you want to end the episode. Hmm... <laughs> Usually, I, was, I, mean, I, I think I have some really fascinating quotes that I wrote down on my phone. What, what, what do fans need to type into Google in order to ping a thing and then get the next uh, Zig Mentality song? <laughs> That's a good question. All right, all right, I mean, let, me just, let me just refer to my list of pre-made thoughts. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, dude. Okay, here's a great thought. This is a thought that humbled me the other day, and I thought... This applies not just to music, it applies to everything. It's so meaningful, and it applies to everything and everyone. And that's only my opinion, okay? Here it is. <laughs> okay, we're ready. The final thought to end on today, guys, tonight. Thank you for this beautiful podcast and all this wonderful stuff. Here we go. Not my quote, by the way, not my quote. It seems to me a failure of intellect to believe that your intellect is so powerful that it could or does know everything. <laughs>